and um, Chi Chi, are we ready to get started? Yes. All right. So today we're going to be talking about um, niches in coaching. And we have Tara Butler Fluke as a speaker. Tara, it has quite um, a stellar bio here. I'm going to try to pick out what's the salient things that to share about her before we get started. She, um, since 2000, has had the passion for helping entrepreneurs and has empowered hundreds of coaches to create and up-level sustainability and profitability and joyous business. She started into co in coaching very early, I believe at the age of 26, when she was ma first made an executive and decided to get a coach. And I think the coaching bug bit her at that moment. And she went on to do a couple of executive positions and then decided to go out on her own. And she decided to get certified and help other coaches become better coaches and up level. And, and that's what she's been doing since then and enjoying it and multiplying her ability to touch lives and, 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 and do what she was put on earth to do. With that, I'll take, um, turn it over to Tara, Tara Fluke. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my presentation here. Um, so yes, I'm very passionate about niche. Uh, I've been doing this a while. I've had my business since 2000 as Chi Chi shared and I have had multiple niches. <laughs> so you can absolutely have the accidental niche. One of the things to notice is who are the people that are being attracted to me and essentially that's how I ended up working with coaches and what I call coach sultans because so I was working with executives um, mostly in fast growing small companies uh, at the executive level and I was finding that so many of them wanted to leave their job and start their own con coaching or consulting practice so it kind of happened organically for me um, and I realized very quickly because I had that contrast that I was really being pulled in that direction. So niche is one of those things that reveals itself. <laughs> um, and there's absolutely ways that you can be um, really intentional about it to have the practice that you are passionate about and is making a huge difference. So that's what I wanna uh, teach you guys today. Oh, I'm realizing I can't probably can't do the poll from here. Oh, yes, I can. So I have a poll for you. I know we have a small group, but let's go ahead and use the poll because we set it up. So I'm curious if you currently have a niche. And if you do, is it pretty specific and only work within the niche? Is it? Yes, it's pretty specific, but I still work with lots of people. Yes, but it's broad. No, but I want to pursue one. And no, but I like to serve, uh, like to serve a diverse market and likely won't choose. I'm curious where you all are. So I'll give you a moment to weigh in. All right, yeah, it looks like, yes, but pretty broad. And then one person who wants to, um, wants no, to- No, I can't share. It's not letting me do, it's me. I'm, I'm oh, can you guys see? Technical difficulties. Can you see that? I see it, but it's not okay, letting good. me do anything with it. Okay. So yeah, so, um, you know, and this is gonna be helpful for, um, for all of you, because if you have a niche right now and it's pretty broad, you might see that there could be value in narrowing. I always say narrow to the degree that it serves. Um, and if you don't have a niche now, I think you will be inspired, hopefully from this presentation at the value of it. And the truth is, is that Coaching is needed more than ever. It doesn't matter if you're an executive coach, leadership coach, wellness coach, grief coach. There has never been a more challenging time uh, in the world of coaching because coaching hasn't been around forever. Um, and I love this. <laughs> it feels like this cartoon uh, really just kind of sums it all up. All the plans that we have made 
keep getting circumvented. You know, we think we're going to get back to normal and then, you know, another surge happens. Um, industry has changed dramatically because of the pandemic. And just with everything that's going on in our world, change is constant. So that is the great news is that it's, we are needed more than ever. The question is, does your ideal client, the people you want to serve, do they know that? Because if it's not seen as essential, people will not make the time, you know, the investment of time, money, or energy. They need to see your work as essential. And if this makes you go, uh-oh, <laughs> then we have some work to do. Um, and that's okay. Because that is our goal is that we want to be essential to our ideal client, not forever. We want to help them bridge a gap and move on. Um, you know, we don't want to, you know, be codependent with our clients, but they need to think that our work is essential to make the investment of time, money, and energy, whether it's an organization that's paying or an individual. And so that's what we're going to really talk about today is not only niche, but how you can find that sweet spot for yourself that where your clients are really leaning in with you and it's stuff that you really want, you're really leaning in on too. So we're gonna dive on into that. So let's start by talking about what, what exactly is niche? Uh, there is the, oops, there is the Oxford Dictionary definition, which is basically around a specialized segment of a market for a particular product or service. So a lot of people just see niche as a marketing thing. I do not. <laughs> and part of this is I've seen with all, you know, hundreds of coaching clients see the value gets deeper the narrower they are. And, you know, one of the examples I like to use is kind of like if you have a gallon of water in a pitcher and you have a pan that's long and thin, wide, but not, it's not that deep. But if you narrow in, you can go much deeper because you have more time and energy to focus in and focus on tools and even curriculum and different things that your clients really need. And this doesn't mean you have to become one of those coach sultans. But if you know that conflict, as an example, is a huge issue with your clients, you can have materials and exercises and things that can help them around conflict, right? So when we get clear about the biggest challenges and desires of our clients, it, it helps us um, help them. So let's talk about Tara Butler Flock's three keys. Uh, you know, this is what I call a true niche. Um, and it really is three things. One is simplicity and clarity of message. Ideally, you know, and this is all in an ideal world, but there is there is a spectrum. When you say I help dot, 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 <laughs> people go, got it. I know exactly what you do um, without going on and on and on, right? So if somebody asks you, what do you do? You don't want to give them a four sentence response in order for them to understand it. Um, and essentially you want not just your ideal client to understand it, you want everybody to understand it, right? I mean, I have many examples where I've been, you know, at a networking event and someone asked what I did and all of a sudden, you know, they go scurrying off and then they come scurrying back with somebody. You need to talk to her. <laughs> So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be, that you know, you're talking to an ideal client, but other people can help, you know, other people can see who you work with as well. The second is that there's a defined network that you can tap into. So as an example, I, I worked with folks that said that they were life purpose coaches. And yes, they work on a specific thing, but that's still not a niche because it, it, you know, everybody could get value from that potentially, right? So getting a defined network that you can tap into is a, is a big piece of this because you need to be able to find them, they need to find you. Um, and the third is common challenges, pain points and desires that your coaching process addresses. So you can be a fantastic coach, but if you don't give a great client experience because you don't really have um, core tenants that you work with, then um, 
you won't have longevity in your relationships. So this really helps having these three things makes you more referable, has allows people to find you instead of you knocking on other people's doors. And it gives them makes ensures they have a really great client experience and that you really can help bridge the gap between where they are and where they want to be as their coach. And by the way, this is this this is really for any service uh, based professional, but I only work with coaches. So um, so here's some misconception and fears. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we don't want to fo focus on what we want, not what we don't want. But here are some of the things that may have come up for you in the past or even today about what may happen if I pick a niche. Oftentimes we think if we narrow, we narrow our opportunities. And actually this is where that narrow to the degree that it serves is important, right? If you get too narrow, you've got to make sure there's enough people um, out there who are interested in your services. But I think a lot of people think that narrowing at all will close the door. And in fact, it will make you more attractive to the people you really want to work with. Um, this is one of my favorites. I still get calls about executive coaching. If you go to my website, it couldn't be more clear who I work with, but people from my past are still referring people to me. It's great because I have lots of clients who do the work that I used to do. <laughs> so I'll refer them and then I get to be the rock star. But I am not repelling people. I, I couldn't be more clear. I am very clear about my niche and I'm still getting all sorts of people knocking on my door because they hear from other people that I'm a good coach. Um, so it, you know, there is, sometimes we do want to repel people because we don't want all the, you know, waste our time and energy talking to people that really aren't going to be a good fit. But oftentimes um, we think if I get niche specific, if I say I work with women, you know, women leaders who, um, but there is a male leader or, you know, um, somebody who is non-gender specific, who has the same challenges, they may choose you as well, okay? Um, I'll be pigeonholed and lose freedom to change my business. You get to change anytime you want. Now there's, you know, we wanna make sure you get a return on investment of your time and energy. So that's part of why you wanna slow down in order to speed up, you wanna explore, you wanna really make sure this is the niche for you before you, shout it out to the world because there is some credibility loss if you are a chronic niche sh shifter <laughs> however if you start going into a niche you you know you will find out very quickly whether it's the right fit for you or not and we're always changing right i look at my ideal client profile every six months and my and it changes it's subtle but it it changes and a lot of my clients um, get what's interesting is that they get narrower over time. They start to get very clear about the psychographics of the people that they love working with, and even some of the challenges. You know, like, oh, I don't like working with people who have mindset issues all the time. Like when it comes up here and there, da da da. I I just had a client like that yesterday, <laughs> who is like, I don't, uh, you know, I know how to work with those saboteurs and and all that, but I just don't want it to be like every single time. Um, so there, that, those are things that can help you along the way to get narrower and clearer about your ideal client. Uh, there won't be enough clients. This is definitely something you want to make sure there is enough people in the field that you're in, um, but it's pretty rare for people to get too narrow. You know, For most of my clients, 15 to 20 clients at a time is their max. So it doesn't take a ton of people to, to uh, find, you know, a full practice. Uh, my current clients will stop working with you. I definitely say transparency is key. And I still have a financial advisor who works with me, who's been working with me for 14 years on and off. He knows I work with coaches. He finds it interesting. He asks questions about it, um, but he's very coach-like. He, he has a team of uh, about 14 people and he just loves working with me and I love working with him and, and so we go, we keep going. Um, let's see, I have to say no to people who aren't in my niche, absolutely not. Again, transparency is key because you don't want the, I have a, a great example of this. I was uh, 
early on in my coaching career, I met somebody who was assisting one of my coaching classes and I really liked his energy. Um, and I said, I think I'll try him out as a coach. Um, was there a question? Um, Somebody and we're, and they had an open mic. Okay. Um, so we we're at a coaching event, like a networking event, and I had just hired him. And we were in this group, and, he, and people said, You know, who do you coach? And he said, I coach professional athletes. And I, I like looked at him and I was like, I am the farthest thing from a professional athlete. And his lack of transparency around that. And the fact that he like boldly said that in front of me, I just like kind of triggered me actually. <laughs> I was like, I don't know about this, right? So as long as we're transparent and sometimes people won't choose us if we're clear, you know, it's like, like I said, I'm the farthest thing from a professional athlete and that there's, you know, I have all these like picked last in fifth grade and the, in the, you know, for volleyball team, you know, that kind of stuff that like, working with somebody who works with professional athletes was just not gonna be a good fit for me, um, even though he was purely capable of coaching me, right? Um, but so transparency is key. If you work in a specific niche and somebody comes to you, you wanna make sure that they're clear that I usually work with dot, 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 but I really feel like I can help you because of X, Y, and Z, right? Um, and last but not, not least, the fear is I don't know how to pick an itch. I don't know where to begin and just get stuck there. So you're in the right place if that is you, because <laughs> we'll be talking about that. Any questions so far? I, I forgot to mention that I love getting questions and comments. So feel free to share. Um, Tara, this is Susana. I I don't know if you're going to cover this later today, but I was wondering if there are tips that you can share on how to narrow a niche. Yes. Okay. You're going to, you're teeing me up. So just in case you didn't know why a niche was useful, here are five reasons. All right. Um, I'm not going to read them. You guys can read it. Well, you're going to do this as a podcast, so I will. I'll, I'll just say you're going to be more attractive to your ideal clients, 100%. You'll deepen your process, your, your toolbox, and even your expertise by narrowing. You create a simple leveraged business. It takes a lot less energy um, to focus in. And you increase your credibility and become an expert in your particular niche and in your sweet spot. Um, and you increase your access to your net niche's network. As an example, you guys contacted me to come speak. I, you know, I'm not knocking on doors anymore. They're knocking on mine. So they're, you know, that's part of becoming an expert in your field. Um, but really, it, it's part of that increased access as well. And you heard me say this, you narrow it to the degree that it serves. One thing I want to make the distinction about is that your niche and your ideal client within that niche is your bullseye right? And then you have your dartboard. Now, most of my clients get to the point where their dartboard and their bullseye are almost identical. There's, you know, they're very discerning. That's one of the things I really help my clients with. A lot of my clients have a fair amount of experience and they don't want to work as hard. They want to be able to say no to clients that aren't really a good fit, dot, dot, dot. Um, now, with that said, your dartboard can be as large as you want. <laughs> I find that over time, even if people feel a little fearful of narrowing, over time they do narrow. Even though their bullseye is really clear, their dartboard might be big at the beginning. And then they say, you know, I don't really want to work with that. No, I think I'd better serve this. No, you know, and, and they start to narrow in. But there's, you know, so you get to say yes to whomever you want regardless of what you pick as a niche. As long as that's a designed alliance between you and the client, there's transparency, and you feel like you can make a significant difference for them. You get to work with whoever you want. So just remember there is that freedom there for you. So here are some of the examples of clients that I've worked with. One of the things that you will notice is that 
there aren't just leadership coaches, executive coaches, wellness coaches. They are specific. They have chosen a sweet spot. Um, most of my clients are focused in on sort of the corporate realm. <laughs> Um, and it's really interesting because I have a mastermind with um, some of my really experienced clients, you know, people who've been doing this for 20 years, they're all making at least $300,000 a year. And one of the things that's gotten very clear in working with me is what their sweet spot is. So they stand out. There is a sea of executive coaches. There is a sea of leadership coaches. There's a sea of wellness coaches. So what is special about you? What is your sweet spot? And I'm going to teach you, Susanna, how to figure that out <laughs> if you don't know. So here we go. So most business coaches come from this left brain, top down approach. And I'm not saying this isn't important. It is imp these are important questions. Where is the greatest coaching needs? Where are, uh, where are are they currently underserved? Who can afford to pay me? Who has discretionary income? And most you know, business coaches are like, here's the top five most successful proven niches, pick one. I have actually been in programs many years ago where literally she's like, you have to pick one of these five. And um, there was a lot of niche switching <laughs> as a result of that. And part of that is that you gotta have credibility in the niche that you serve. All right, so you can't just say, I'm gonna be a money coach if you don't have credibility in that space. Now you can absolutely build credibility, um, but you need to have some. And credibility comes in three forms. One is I've walked in your shoes. I've been an entrepreneur for 21 years and uh, you know been a coach for 21 years and have done it very successfully, right? I'm a maker of champions. I have worked with dozens, hundreds, whatever the number is, and help them bridge the gap between here and there, you know, um, create sustainable, joyous businesses. And then the credentials, education, and professional experience. You know, I was a former executive, and then I became an executive coach. Um, I have a PCC, a CC, CPCC, you know, dot, 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 dot. What are the, those credentials? And one thing to know is that coaches think the most important thing is number three. Like, oh, uh, maybe I should just get more training. And I don't believe that's true. Your clients actually care, don't care so much about number three. They care a lot about number one and number two. Um, some of them don't care about number one. Um, I used to be in a coaching consortium where everybody else was ICO psychologists. They never worked inside an organization. And um, we're basically focused on Fortune 100 companies. And no one ever chose me as a coach, even though I had been an executive myself for a company that went public, you know, dot, dot, dot. They never chose me. <laughs> they wanted the people that had never worked in an organization, never walked in their shoes, but boy, they had the credentials. So part of this is understanding, first of all, what matters to my ideal clients? And how can I continue to build this credibility? And to know that you don't, you know, you have to have at least one but boy, if you have two, you're, you're pretty set. And if you have three, you're gold. You really are. Here, I want clarification, I'm sorry. You mentioned that clients don't care so much about number three, which is professional experience. They some care. do, some don't. Uh -huh. They care like As an example, I have a client who um, has never worked in an organization, but she has a master's in OD. She's been doing this for 25 years. She just got certified um, by the ICF. And, you know, so I have a lot of clients that are like, I need to get certified. I need to get certified. If you want to get certified for your own, you know, like part of this is to know thy client, right? What matters to them? Credentials may matter to them. Um, education, professional experience may matter to them. What I'm saying is that oftentimes we overestimate how much it matters. As an example, I've never had somebody ask me um, when I was an executive coach if I was certified. <laughs> they, they cared about who, what other companies I had worked with. Um, they did care about the fact that I had been in their shoes because their company was trying to go public too. You know, there's other things that mattered to that particular ideal client. Um, 
And that's an important thing to know um, and find out if you don't know. Any other questions about credibility? You know, Tara, um, um, I understand what you're saying and that creates a little bit of a conflict uh, inside me because as I see a, as an ICF chapter, right? So we're here to promote, we're here to create awareness about the importance of have, being a certified professional coach versus somebody who calls themselves a coach about being credential versus non-credential. And so I'm struggling a little bit. I understand what you're saying about clients. You know, some clients may not even know what credentialing is or ICF yeah. even exists. Right? It doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it's not important. Yeah. So how do we reconcile that? Well, and that's the thing is that it is a differentiator. Um, you know, and, and please don't don't let me miss misspeak there. I, I mean, I think when, like, as an example, when new coaches come to me and want me to build their business, I, the first thing I say is I want you to perfect your craft. And I only work with certified coaches because I want to put great coaches out in the world. Right. So I hold a very, very strong belief in, in ICF and what we do and why it's important. I also do think it is a differentiator. And um, what I do see with coaches, though, is that they always think if I take one more training program, as an example, I see, I see this right now with positive intelligence coming out, right? Oh, I should take this and I should get certified in positive intelligence. And it's like, well, does your ideal client, would they want something like that? Like, is that really going to help you build your business? You know, so I want you to be a critical thinker when it comes to what's important for my own professional development to be on par with my peers and what my clients need and not assume, you know, because coaches just always assume if I get certified in another tool or another assessment that that's going to be valuable to the client. It might not be valuable to the client. It doesn't mean not to do it. But I see people investing so much money there that thinking that is going to be beneficial in their business and, it, and that's not always the case. So it's just being critical thinker when it comes to come to that and make sure it's something that's really going to get you closer to what you really want in your work. Yeah. Is that helpful, Susanna? Yeah, I wanted really? to, um, yeah, I wanted to say, oh God, this is so, <laughs> This is so um, relieving for me and I'm so glad and grateful that I did um, choose to come on today and take this because this is like hearing an answer prayer because I've just been praying and thinking like, okay, um, Mitch and Khan, I have been looking at different um, fields that I know I have a strong interest in, but I also know that um, I'm really positioned to really master in one. And yeah. so just been kind of on a journey since I started um, learning training to become a life coach uh, since uh, early of 2020. And um, <clears throat> even um, even taking um, NL, learn to be a NLP practitioner, neuro oh, cool. linguistic programmer. And that was something that I wound up finding by accident, I bumped into it, had no idea about it, but which helped me with the whole um, life coaching, how to navigate on the other side of the, of, of the fence and helping people. And you, you said something that's so key because I'm kind of one of those, I'm like, oh man, maybe I should take this because I'm interested in this and this will help me and so forth. And I would just look and then uh but then i'm like okay but i'm really kind of um a bit tapped out from doing those the life coaching and nlp um study and i i pray and i'm like okay lord, lord ain't reveal it to me to go in this area but it's like you're saying feeling that i need to be um perfect yeah and um that's why i haven't really started um launching 
launch my business yet because I'm still having to understand how to put it in a professional format instead of switch to the um, switching from pers being personal and conversation like talk to your friends and so mm -hmm. forth versus putting it in a structure and discipline format and so forth where you include administrative and administer and still honing in on the niches and it's like man what one point I'm thinking I'm going this way and then something comes about and show me oh something else in that area and I'm like man so you talking about even there's even specialties in the niches it's really like helping me because I didn't oh. even think of that I'm thinking the niche is the specialty not realizing that even the niche can can be a broad um area of well, other you uh, know places. just picking a just picking a niche as broad as a niche may be saying like I'm a leadership coach is going to have you be in the top 90%, I mean, 10% of coaches. Like most people do not pick a niche. And if you look at ICF, the ICF studies, just picking a niche, even a broad one like that, you, people who have a niche make twice as much money on average. So, um, and the, here's, the, here's the beauty of it. You can always narrow you can always get more specific. Like, so don't pressure yourself to like get really specific. If it feels, doesn't feel right and light to you, it might really be helpful, honestly, to keep it a little bit more broad because what we discover in the work of it is part of our education, right? What mm -hmm. I'm trying to help you is, is like, you know, let's be more attractive from a marketing standpoint, but let's eliminate people that I know I'm not going to want to work with. You know, I'm not interested in those challenges. Working with those challenges really isn't fun for me. So like as specific as you can get, but then you're going to get even more specific as you work with people, because you just figure out like, oh, you know, like I, I have some clients who love people who are a bit resistant, like that rebel. And I have other people that are like, oh, I just really want people that are, you know, open and, you know, dot, dot, dot. So these are the type of things that you discover in the work. Um, and that's why it is ever changing. And you will just get clearer and clearer the more you work. And what's interesting is that, you know, some of the clients that I work with have been doing this for 20 years and have been ignoring the tap on the shoulder, right? They know what they like working with but they haven't claimed it and they're not, weren't willing to say no to the people that were actually dragging their energy down. And by the way, when your energy is being dragged down by a client, it affects everything because <laughs> your energy is down and then you have to like, you know, it, it's hard to, it, it affect, can affect even your best clients when you have some clients that are not good fits. So don't put too much pressure on yourself, Shirley it will never be perfect. You know, that's the beauty of life is that it is imperfectly perfect. <laughs> and that's yeah. part of the learning for all of us. Yeah. And I, for me, like you said, I'm really just been taking my time now working more on the learning the, uh, the listener role and being more hands-on with the techniques and the approaches and just trying to figure out how to put them in different stages. So I'm not trying to rush and be like, oh yeah, now that I got this certification, let me just go out here and kind of like throw spaghetti on the wall and see what stick. I'm kind of make sure I want to know what the ingredients are in the spaghetti yeah. before I start serving it or throw it on the wall, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. so just you'll save a lot of time and energy. Craft, like you said, that's what I, I think there's beauty in, in, in the discovery and you can be intentional about the discovery too, right? So like, um, you know, believe me, I early on in my career threw a lot of spaghetti at the wall, wasted a lot of time and energy. I learned a lot that I can now teach my, my clients. <laughs> so there's beauty in that, right? There's, it's always imperfectly perfect. And, you know, I love th that I can save people time and energy and help them find resonance more quickly through the work that we do. So um, it's all perfect. And you know, no one journey is better than the other, but it's really about finding the journey that resonates for you.
All right, let's keep going. But and we're gonna Shirley, if you if you're liking this so far, I think you'll like it even more as you, we dive deeper in. So I always like to start with what I call the bottom up approach. This is my preferred starting place, and not that the bottom, uh, the top down questions don't matter, they do. But when we start there, we're starting from our sort of logical left brain versus what resonates with us. So, you know, start with some things like, where do I already have credibility and expertise? Sometimes we forget, <laughs> right? Um, what am I most passionate about? Uh, what has my own journey been? How have I transformed my own life? Usually we find coaching because we had a, a transformation ourselves. I, I chose coaching because I had an amazing coach and it changed my life and my trajectory. And, you know, I've had many, many clients that have had that when they had a coach, suddenly they're like, that's what I want to do, right? Um, what type of people are drawn to me already? Who are the clients I enjoy working with the most? And for those of you who are early in your journey, this is even some of the um, peer coaching and different things that you've done. Like, what did you like? What, what didn't you like? Um, and where do these people commune? What did they have in common? Sometimes we kind of have this like aha moment, like, oh, gosh, look, all these people you know, commune here, you know, all of them are a part of this community. And I, I never even realized that before. So those are questions definitely to ask yourself. And by the way, the PowerPoint is available for you. Um, and so you can write down all these questions, but if you, if you want, you can get a copy of the PowerPoint at the end. So I always like to start with the bottom up and then ask those questions, go out, discuss. <laughs> <laughs> make sure you see the mutual lean in and then make sure that the top down questions also work, right? Um, what I found over and over, I can't tell you how many times people have said, well, I really want to work with uh, this population, um, but they can't afford to work with me. And all these assumptions that people make and, you know, what I found, you know, first of all, there's, there are different models of coaching that you can consider, um, group coaching and other things to make it less expensive for people if that's an issue. But if this work is essential, they will find a way. Um, I have had, you know, as an example, I've had people that have worked with nonprofit leaders and part of their process was to help them apply for grants to get this paid for. Um, you know, there's, there, there's often a way. And anytime someone says, I've always wanted to work with, but <laughs> I get really curious um, because oftentimes we just uh, discount it and ignore our passion. And there's almost always a way. So um, if there's any of you that have been thinking, I wanna work with this underserved group that doesn't have a lot of money, there are ways to have other people pay for that um, and to find the resources for that so that you're not just giving away your gift for free or really, really, really low cost. Um, it's all about the, what I call the equal energy exchange too. Okay, so any questions about, I do have more about the how, <laughs> but any questions about sort of that sort of approach to things or any comments? All right, let's keep moving. So here's some how. I am, you know, one of the things that I find so fascinating, every once in a while, like I've had somebody recently come to me who created this really elaborate program um, with audios and videos and printed workbooks and did not talk to a single person about it until they launched it. And then they wondered why people weren't buying it. And the one thing to remember is that we work with people. One way to draw people to you is to be in meaningful dialogue with people. So just going out and talking to people has a high propensity to get things going for you and your business in a lot of different ways. 
But one of the things I'm really big on is getting the litmus test, right? Don't just like pick out your bullseye and just put it out to the world. It's like, okay, if these are the people I want to work with, I'm going to explore that. And I'm going to talk to some of them or talk to some of the centers of influence in that niche and ask about what their biggest challenges are. What are their biggest desires? What do they deem essential? Where are they leaning in? And make sure that I'm leaning in with that, right? Because, uh, and, and by the way, they might want things that you don't want to give. As an example, like with the prof nonprofit leaders, like over and over, I have people say, I don't want to help with fundraising. There are, other, there are specialists that, that help in fundraising. You don't necessarily have to do something just because the, your ideal client is asking for it. Um, but there needs to be enough of what they're leaning in with and you're leaning in with to create what I call that sweet spot. So I recommend, you know, if you have no clue, <laughs> you can pick a few to explore. Comparison always helps, right? It's kind of like dating. If you really don't know what you want, go out on a bunch of dates with different people and you'll figure it out pretty quickly what you don't want and that can help lead to what you do want. Um, if you already have a niche in mind, like um, leadership coaching, uh, Chi Chi had shared earlier that she wants to do leadership coaching with the C-suite. It's like, okay, I'm gonna just dive into that. I'm gonna set up interviews with people in that niche, potential clients themselves, other professionals that work with them and influencers, you know, people that work, you know, um, you know, there might be, you know, as an example, I just had somebody who worked with doctors and that might be things like administrators of hospitals um, and that sort of thing. So ask them, what are their biggest challenges, biggest obstacles, biggest desires? What are the things that they deem essential? You know, what are the things that are keeping them from, from having the happy, joyous life that they want? Um, and narrow that based on what you discover, right? Sometimes people will explore one niche and realize, mm, I'm not really leaning in on this. They might be leaning in with me, but I'm not really leaning in with them. And sometimes they'll say, great, thank God I didn't just like go out and build a program around that and, <laughs> and then figure that out, right? So it's a great opportunity to get clear. And an important part about this is to really, really rely on your heart and your energy um, and your intuition on where are you feeling them lean in? Where are you feeling them lean out? Um, and where, where are you kind of on the edge of your seat? Like, ooh, and where are you kind of like, uh, eh. and just really pay attention to that. So keep interviewing people until you're crystal clear <laughs> about who your both your ideal client is and your niche. So as an example, if you're, if you work with women executives and help them, um, I had one, one person who helped women really claim their voice. She called it become full-throated leaders. Now, not every woman leader was a great client for her. There are psychographics and demographics that really were the right fit for, for her. So niche is, is really helpful. And by the way, sometimes niche can be revealed through the ideal client, right? So if you just start to write down who are the clients I love working with, sometimes you can be like, what niche feels like a good fit to that. So it's a little chicken and egg. All right. And then you find that sweet spot. And that is where your talents and expertise and interests overlap with their biggest challenges, obstacles, and desires. If these are minor challenges, obstacles, and desires, and they have big challenges that you don't serve, you might not be deemed essential, right? So you really, um, you know, there, I, I think about my life and it's like, what are my biggest challenges? I could compartmentalize those. Here are my biggest challenges with my business, as a mother, um, as a partner, as a dog owner, <laughs> you know? So part of this is you can kind of play around with that and find sort of the area that really, um, really sticks out. <laughs> Shirley, you're so sweet. She says, I definitely need a copy of the presentation slides. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right. Now, um, this is just sort of on a high level because oftentimes people pick a niche and then they're like, okay, now what? So first of all, one of the things you wanna do is define your process to address the challenges and desires of your niche. 
So even if you are a solidly a coach in your sessions where you say, what would you like to talk about today? And you dive in. There's something that I refer to as the big A agenda and the little A agenda. So every coaching call is the little A agenda. You want to make sure that the little A agenda is hooked to the big A agenda. And the big A agenda is why they hired you. What is, you know, what's the gap they're trying to bridge in their lives or their work? Um, so you want to make sure that you have tools and a process. You know, this is why some of my leadership clients, they might do assessments and some other things. They might do values work to use that as a filter for decisions. Like you get to decide what's, what the process is. You just want to make sure your ideal clients are leaning in on your process. That's another place to get feedback. Once you have a clear idea of what the process is and what's included in that, then you build out your program offerings, right? It's like, okay, if this is my process, how long does it take for someone to move through this on average? And you know, you play with this over time. So it's not like this random, like I have six month packages and 12 month packages. It's like in six months, this is the journey that we usually go on, right? And of course it's going to be customized and it's gonna be unique to that person. But it, then it starts to make sense why you have why your program is six months um, dot 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 and you build out tools and that doesn't mean that you have to build them out you can borrow them from other people and give them credit you know um, oh I use Stephen Covey's four quadrants when people are having problems prioritizing or you know just gathering tools for the things that they need more support on and once you have that then you define your messaging and what I call your compelling value proposition. This is where the essential piece comes in. <laughs> it's like, okay, what makes my work essential to my ideal client? And making sure that, that you define that in your messaging. And then you also create your brand if you don't have one or revise it based on you know, if you need to or want to and build out or revise the website. And then from there, once that, you know, and, and some of this can be in, in parallel, but um, then you focus on business development. It's like, da-da, I'm ready. I'm ready for business. I've got all my branding done. I've got my programs all set. I, you know, I know what I'm charging. And now I can really start to tap into that network, build out strategic alliances with others, other professionals, um, uh, coaching companies, different things, and develop a business development and marketing strategy. So, um, you know, easier said than done. <laughs> this is a process, but I wanted to kind of give you the clue of what to do once you define niche, what else is needed to really have that have be ready to attract those people to you. And the beautiful thing about this is you will start to have people drawn to you as opposed to you having to like go out and sell yourself um, through this process. Uh, oftentimes, so one of the things my clients do is when they do these interviews is they develop a summary of findings and then they follow up with people and they say, here's what I heard and here's the program, the process I built out. Does it feel like that resonates with you? Da, da, da. So they're getting more feedback, more of a litmus test. And often at that point, people are like, I love this. Can I work with you? So um, there's, there's some benefit there as well going out and talking to these ideal clients. Any questions about this part or comments? Thank you, right. Tara. No, no questions. Okay, <clears throat> Shirley looks like she has one. Go ahead, unmute yourself. Um, I, yeah, I do have a question. Something came to mind because um, for the um, offering part. Like, are there, because I know, like, when I was uh, part of my um, life coach training, they had like different certain resources that kind of help you out to help you build the layout or build the process for your um, business and so forth. Do you know of any particular resource or anything? Is that something you recommend? Because in my mind, I'm like, okay you have an idea and this is a field I've never really been in. So all I have is an idea, but needing like that template 
to kind of take my ideas and plug it into it to get the layout structure. So I don't know, what is your thoughts on that? Well, you probably can imagine. Yeah, I mean, I have all sorts of workbooks, templates, trainings. You know, I my the toolbox for my clients is very broad and very deep. Um, and, you know, we all know that it's not the knowing, it's the knowing doing gap where, our, where we are most effective as coaches, right? So part of this to remember with the toolbox and, and all that is that these are tools that, to support them, but it's still a discovery. It's still like what resonates with, with you and maybe they don't know what resonates and maybe they feel blocked like, uh, I don't, you know, and that's where the coaching really happens where you help, you know, pull that out of your clients um, and help manage their saboteurs and other things. Usually, what I usually find is that with my clients, um, in their heart, they know. <laughs> and, <sighs> and they just aren't willing to claim it for a lot of different reasons. And part of that is to, you know, get them to the place where, the, you know, and that's the thing that's really interesting is that, um, and, and I think this is not unique to me. I think that one of the things that happens through the coaching process is people build confidence. You can't promise confidence, right? It is a result of, because they start to trust themselves, you know, and they start to see their value. They start to, you know, dot, dot, dot. So, um, you know, I have tools to, till the cows come home. And part of this is customizing the experience and also following the rhythm of the client, which is what I recommend for you as well. When you build out your, you know, don't, there, there's like a spectrum, right? On one side is like life coaching, co-active coaching, you know, all the things that we learned in coaching school. And then on this end is people who call themselves a coach, but they're really trainers, um, trainers and mentors. And then there's all this in between and you get to decide where you are on the spectrum. Um, I mean, one thing I can tell you when I was working with CEOs, <laughs> they're like, I love that you asked me questions, but you need to give me some, some options here, right? Like when I was too much on this side, it irritated them. <laughs> so then it's like, okay, I'm gonna like say, here's some options or here's some things in my experience, but what resonates with you? Does that resonate with you? What, where does it not resonate? And define their answer, right? So, you know, and, and coaching schools do their job. ICF does their job. It makes sure that our coaching skills are honed. Um, and sometimes there's more, more play in there. And, and that's part of the decision of where am I in that? And same with the toolbox. How many tools am I going to offer? Am I going to offer trainings and other things to supplement the coaching that I do? Does that help them bridge the gap more success successfully? And, and am I excited about that? You know, I have some clients that are like, I don't want to do toolbox. <laughs> so, you know, you get to decide and it's all about, you know, it does help make you more valuable to, you know, uh, mm -hmm. usually. You know, there's a, some, sometimes busy executives don't care about a toolbox. They want the summary. <laughs> Sum it up for me. Okay. Is that helpful? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So here's some next steps for you. So if you're nicheless, use those bottom up questions to hone in. And if you, you know, you might even want to use those just to make sure that the niche that you've chosen really feels resonant to you um, and choose one to three to explore. I, I would say any more than that, it just becomes a lot, right? Um, and you can take that approach of, of dating, right? I was one of those people, I'm just like a monogamous at heart, right? So I did not like dating multiple people. I would date and then I, it would be like a yes or a no about three months in. <laughs> so that might be your approach too, or you might choose to you know, really explore multiples at, at the same time. Um, you know, especially if you're really leaning in one direction, you might decide, I'm just going to pursue this one. And, and then if it doesn't feel like that, like really resonant in that mutual lean in, then maybe I'll go back and, and take a, a broader approach and explore a few. There's no right way other than what's right for you. 
Um, if you have one already, set up some interviews in your niche to further hone in. You know, I, I, I hope that a lot of you have been like, gee, what is my sweet spot? You know, and if you have been doing this a while, I mean, one of the things I love doing in my mastermind with my diamond clients is like, they all talk about their sweet spot and they have started to partner with each other and started to refer to each other because someone else's, it's like why garage sales work, right? It's like, oh, this is, I don't want to work with this person. I'm going <laughs> to tee it over. You know, someone else's junk is someone else's treasure. Um, and the clearer you get, the easier you'll be uh, in terms of be able to be referable. And um, you might also find that, that you actually compliment some other people that are, you know, leadership coaches out there, executive coaches or wellness coaches. Okay. Also, if you want to get the free interview guide, and this is, this will be useful for the, you know, the explorers or the people that want to for, further hone in. Um, you can get that and I'll put these in the chat um, and get the PowerPoint from today. And I also just want to offer a complimentary business breakthrough session to anybody. You know, we have a very small group today. So um, usually I limit it to, to like three, but we have so few people. I'm just going to offer it to all of you. And this is just an opportunity to, to meet with me. It's complimentary. Um, we'll talk about where you are, where you want to be. We'll really examine that gap and I'll make sure you walk away with a lot of value. Um, and that's about a half hour. And if it feels resonant for us to continue talking about potentially working together, we both have the mutual lean in, we can do that. But otherwise I'll just bless you on your journey. And it's just one of the things, one of my favorite things to do. I just love helping support coaches and, and helping them with their business. And so I wanna offer that as well. And I'm gonna put those in the chat. There's that one. And there, that is for the business breakthrough session. And this is for the interview guide and the um, PowerPoint. So. And it looks like we're gonna have a volunteer for you, Tara. Awesome, oh, what's happening? The, what chat. just happened there? Oh, I, I must've clicked on it. Sorry guys, hold on, here we go. Okay, let's get back to the PowerPoint. So. What questions do you have? We have a few minutes. So if anybody has anything, I'd love to dive in. Surely. I love how inquisitive you are. It's awesome. <laughs> you can tell um, the movie. Um, so um, I was wondering um, also, what is your, um, your view or your take on being a life coach for people individually versus of being a life coach for a group. And is there flexibility for someone to have both? Or is that something- 100%. I, I, this is also um, niche specific, right? <laughs> An ideal client yeah, specific. I was like, as an example, uh, working with my, my client who works with doctors, um, part of this inquiry, she really wanted to do group group stuff. Turns out that organizations really want to do group stuff because of budget. Um, and people will sign up for it in a large organization when it's free. When she was looking at doing groups um, like with, with people ra rather than through organizations really going to individuals and having them in groups, they're like, no, because it, it was so important to them to be with peers and their time was so limited um, that they wanted to make sure, like they, they just weren't really open to that. So part of this is, yes, uh, there are all these different options from a, a, um, a business model standpoint. It's one of the things I help my clients figure out, um, like, you know, what's resonant with me? Ooh, I think I wanna do this, but then to make sure you're out talking with your ideal clients and making sure it's something that resonates with them. Some people just aren't group people. Some people only want group. They would much rather have group than one-on-one. -on -one. And it really does depend. And sometimes, you know, there's lots of different ways that you could do groups. You can do group coaching, you can do group masterminds, you can do things that are more like training with some coaching, 
there's all sorts of things that are available and part of that is navigating what do they want what do i want to give and um sometimes people are like darn i really wanted to do like a have a full day vip day because that just sounds really cool to me and and the clients were like yeah that's not really really what i what i want right so we really need to make sure that our offers are resonating um and that's part of going out and talking to people is making sure you're you get that litmus test okay awesome thank you a lot and well, let me say this too shirley is that it it is easiest and easy is uh, you know i'm not shy of hard work but it is definitely easiest to start one-on-one -on -one, um because it's just easier to enroll than group group stuff but you also discover so much in the one-on-one -on -one that could contribute to group group stuff so you know not that it's a hundred percent of the time but most of my clients start with one-on-one -on -one and then add on a group component and oftentimes part of the group component is that they will have people uh you know basically grandfathered into the group to create a quorum um mm -hmm. and so they can have sort of a pilot and really make sure that the group experience works okay all right thank you that's so you're good. welcome <laughs> That's a little extra on a little bit of a business model <laughs> stuff for you. What so other Tara, questions do you have? So Tara, I have, um, I think I have a question in this, so bear with me. So um, after my 35 year career ended in 2017, I launched my own business. What I thought I was gonna do is leadership development coaching. What has happened, and uh, this program today is absolutely perfect is that I've been in a process of whittling away things that don't work. Um, and so I think that at this point, more than ever, I have clarity around my niche. So it looks something like this, leadership, then DE and I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then more specifically, the LGBTQ community with allies. And so I've written a lot of notes here about different acronyms and different things that I think might resonate. Um, I came out in 1982 in my career. I spent 35 years in, in corporate working on five continents, 20 countries as um, an openly gay man in human resources uh, and operations. I think I have that experience and credibility that you're talking about. Uh, I listed off, you know, I have podcasts out there, articles out there, nonprofit roles that align with this, videos, talks, that type of stuff. So my question, uh, and I'm going to write a book that's going to launch in uh, 20, uh, Q1 2022, that's this specific thing, right? So my question to you is, how much of an appetite is there for this, since you have much broader view than, than I do at this moment? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I mean, I have a lot of, one of the things that my clients do is they do the research. I get to read all the research. So I, I have a bit of a pulse. One thing I can say, if anybody who works in that, in sort of diversity and inclusion is it actually helps. I have seen that it helps to narrow on the thing that you really know. Okay. Um, especially as a white man uh the you know in, in the diversity and in inclusion space people might go huh right but to say that you focus in on the lbgtq plus community that really is your lane right that you've walked um and and i don't i, I do not need to be right about this this is something i encourage you to research but what i can say because i've had people um a lot of different people were like explore that space and there's been some very clear feedback about wanting more black and brown voices in what is considered the DEI space. So, mm -hmm. to, and to realize that that those could be some of your partners, right? Like this is your piece <laughs> and that maybe you partner with other people that, that address the other areas within that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, because I do think that you know, diversity is many things. Right now, there, there tends to be a, a certain focus I'm seeing with organizations. Um, but that's, I think, is ironic because diversity is, is many things. Is that like, wh who are the disenfranchised 
folks and like we all bring value when we're together. And I think that's that could be really cool to partner with some other people where their lanes intersect with yours um, to create something really special. Um, so, and you might choose not to, right? You might choose to just like, this is where I, where I live and you might, you know, you could have them bring in other people to address the other areas. Um, I, I, think, I think I'm not an expert in that. So, <laughs> well, thank you. But here's the thing you gave me, you gave me confirmation. You know, I, I believe in woo woo. I don't live in California. However, I believe in woo woo. And I mean that with respect. So what you just said is exactly where I am right now. There are two African-American women that I partnered with. We've already had one uh, opportunity to present together and it blew people's minds to see a white male and a black female in a room talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and um, allyship and privilege. So um, I wrote an article actually on this because I am white and there's an automatic assumption when I show up. So you're right, exactly what I'm doing is I'm working on these two strategic partnerships that get me access into rooms for the broader DE&I, and then I can go into the narrow lane around the LGBTQ experience uh, of coming out, staying out, and then also what it is to be an ally to individuals, whether it's for that community or for another community. For example, I worked in a female dominated organization for most of my career and was always a sponsor, ally, and advocate for women. So thank you. You've given me exactly what I was looking for, which is I'm on the right track and partnering with these two women. So thank you. Awesome. And I, and I would definitely encourage you to talk to HR folks, CHRO folks, um, and other people in the, in that space, you know, like who are the other, other folks that uh, may want to be around the table with me? Um, because it is one of those things, and I'm sure you all know, you know, well-intentioned organizations have done a lot around uh, diversity and inclusion in the last 18 months, and most of them have failed. And, um, you know, there is definitely research there for you to look into and to really ask the question, why have they failed? What is needed to bridge this gap? Um, and, you know, I think it's a really interesting question, and I think that's really part of the work you're probably here to to, to give, but well, for you, you. Your work is much needed. Thank you. I appreciate everything that you shared with me, and I have taken five pages of notes. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> well, good. Oh, we're at the top of the hour. So um, thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun, and please reach out. If you have any follow-up questions, um, please reach out. I, I love to be in service, um, and you can check out. I also have a blog that has, like, hundreds of articles for coaches. So, um, cause I've been writing a long time. So check that out as well. That might be a useful resource for you. Okay. And we can get the slides you said from the breakthrough link. From the, yeah, if you do the, if you go to the broadviewcoaching.com slash niche, there is a page there that will give you the, um, the interview guide and the slides from today. And okay. if you can't figure that out, just email me. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. We have a small group today. I have everything kind of automated because sometimes I speak in larger groups, but I am, you know, just feel free to email me. It's fine. Awesome. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this. So Tara, as your technical support for today, I just want to say thank you very much for everything that you shared with us. I thought you did an outstanding job of giving us information that quite frankly is relevant um, and uh, applicable, you know, can be applied going forward. So uh, I know that uh, Chi Chi had to jump off and I just wanted to make sure that you knew that we were very, very grateful for what you shared. <laughs> thank you so much. I see Shirley going, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you so much. And I love this work and I think you can tell this is an example of when you find that sweet spot that you love, like I think the enthusiasm and passion is, um, it, it, it drives you. So I was so happy to be here today. Stay in touch. And good luck on your journeys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone.